Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Welcome to this supplemental uh, midweek edition uh, of the podcast. It's a great opportunity for me to well, talk about some of the things about knives that I can't quite slip into these interview shows that we do on Sundays uh, and uh, things that don't come up on Thursdays. This is just my opportunity to tell you about com- some of the new knives that are coming out that look interesting to me, some of the new uh, some of the new movements and actions in my own collection. And, uh, and then tonight we're going to be talking about my 10 most carried, top 10 most carried or used fixed blade knives of 2020. And the reason I, I say... Uh, carried or used is that uh, because I don't get to carry too many fixed blade knives too often. So I <clears throat> I expanded my list. Uh, you know, I recently did one on most carried uh, tactical folders of 2020, most carried traditional folders of 2020. This is my most carried and used fixed blades of 2020. Now we're going to get to the state of the collection, uh, but you're going to find that there's nothing there today because it seems like some of the lessons from No New Knife November uh, rubbed off and uh, I, I haven't gotten anything new uh, to speak of. Uh, but since we're going to be taking a deep dive into my 10 10 most carried and used uh, fixed blades with a couple of runners up. I figured that's a that's a pretty good look into my collection anyway. So uh, we will be skipping the state of the collection this evening, uh, day, afternoon, morning, whenever you're listening to this. We're not getting to that. But first, uh, let's do a pocket check, shall we? Now, uh, today, I carried something. Uh, today was a study in contrast for me. I carried a knife I don't carry too often, um, which is this beautiful... Greg Lightfoot custom element. Uh, I had Greg on the show, and uh, he's a really interesting guy. He's been on a, a couple of the shows and and also uh, Town Hall. And he lives up there in uh, Western Canada. Um, he's got a ranch, and he just makes knives and lives the life of Riley on his ranch, making saunas, making dirt bikes, doing all sorts of stuff, having fun, hunting, playing, and then making cool knives. So this one is a bit of a beast. It's very thick. It's a pocket hog. Uh, And not for nothing, but that clip is not the most capacious. So I can't wear it with every every pair of jeans or every pair of pants there. But every once in a while, I'll break this thing out just for the the sheer luxury of it. And let's not mistake it. This is a luxury item. This is an expensive custom-made knife that I carry and never use. So I mean, could could you could you come up with a better definition for a luxury knife? Uh, but I love this thing, and uh, well, I'll have it forever. The action on this thing has uh, has really broken in beautifully and smoothly too. I'm going to put this over here on the knife cam so you can get a closer look at it. Look at that thing. Yes, it looks like a shark. Everything he designs looks a bit like a shark, and. Uh, what really attracted to, uh, me to this is, uh, if you can see, it has a very deep recurve uh, and and a long front portion uh, recurve tanto here. So big, heavy, thick blade, big, heavy, thick handle. Uh, in in an unusual configuration, he doesn't really do plain uh, tactical micarta and stuff like that anymore. But hey, what can I say? He was nice enough to accommodate me. Secondly. And uh, it's last, but certainly not least, it is least in size, I carried uh, my relatively new Case Peanut. This I bought from a gentleman on the uh, on Blade Forums, and uh, it's got the CV steel, which is chrome vanadium, which means it's high carbon and will rust if you don't uh, take good care of it or put a patina on it. That uh, patina came on, uh, on the knife when I received it from uh, the guy I bought it from. And the patina is beautiful, and these edges on these blades are outstanding. This guy had a magical touch and made this thing really sharp. Uh, of course, I'm a sucker for the for the jig bone, and uh, this is the beautiful chestnut. I believe it's chestnut jigged bone. And for those of you who hear bone all the time, bone, bone, it's the shin bone of cows uh, that you usually find. Uh, for knife handles that have bone handles. Sometimes you'll get camel bone or more exotic uh, bones, but this no doubt is cow shin bone. 
Uh, and if you could see it, you would love it. It is beautiful. Uh, it's uh, pocket worn, which means the uh, the edges are rounded off. That's kind of a thing Case does uh, to sell knives that maybe look like they've been in your pocket longer. Maybe maybe those are the knives that they sell to people who have a lot of knives and want the worn in look on some of them, uh, but don't carry any of them enough to actually wear them in which would probably describe me pretty well, if I'm going to be 100% honest. Uh, but anyway, that was my uh, study in contrast. That was my uh, that was my pocket check for today. That was my carry. Uh, the massive light foot element and the diminutive case peanut in chrome vanadium steel. Uh, so next, I want to talk about a knife that uh, I got to experience this weekend. <clears throat> I went to uh, visit my folks in Ohio for my dad's uh, birthday, a very special one, but I don't know if I should announce it. Well, oh, whatever. He's 80. And uh, I think I mentioned it on another show, but he's a spry and awesome and very with it 80. Anyway, I went home uh, to Ohio to help uh, my family celebrate with him. And uh, I asked my father, how's the Tengu? I wanted to check in. The last night I got him, uh, what was it? What was the occasion? Father's Day, I think. I got him the Benchmade Tengu, uh, which is this beautiful, it's a design by Jay Oser, who's a who's a, uh, a hot uh, sort of traditional uh, custom knife maker. Um, and this Benchmade Tengu is a flipper designed from, uh, from one of his designs. It's unique because it looks a lot like a traditional folder in the uh, profile of the, of the handle itself. And then in that, the fact that it has an inlaid shield, uh, a white shield shaped shield uh, in the black G10. Now, uh, oh, oh, that, so it looks traditional, but the thing that's very uh, odd about it is that it has a Tanto flipper blade on it, and it's a liner lock. And uh, it's a very unique look to me, this mix of uh, Tanto, which is uh, obviously a, a, a Japanese-inspired design and an ancient design, uh, blended with this uh, um, sort of neutral, traditional slip joint handle style. So I got it from my father knowing he loves tantos, he loves uh, Japanese swords, but he also loves uh, slip joints. I figured this was a nice sort of uh, amalgam. No, that's a different knife. I thought this was a nice sort of combination of the two. Anyway, uh, there for the weekend, I checked it out and he he this is his daily carry now. And it bangs around in his pocket and then it collects lint and dust and it got a little bit dull just as it should. My dad is using this for everything. And uh, so after after uh, six months or so, uh, flipping it, it is in beautiful shape. It's very, very smooth, and uh, it's an impressive knife. I'm really glad I got it from my dad, and I'm really glad I got a chance to check it out and, and really you know experience it for myself in hand. So that is my update. The Benchmade Tengu, you've heard me complaining a lot about Benchmade, uh, probably for the whole duration of this podcast. Um, you know the things I say about Benchmade, but uh, you know credit has to be given where credit is due. Jim, I apologize for the graphic. I sent you a misspelling. It's actually Benchmade, people. I'm sorry, that's my mistake. That's not Jim. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, here's an update. Benchmade isn't horrible, even though I like to uh, perseverate on on its on its pedestrian nature. This this knife is beautiful and worth every dime, and it's not cheap. So that's my update. Benchmade Tengu great knife. All right. So uh, if you like what we do here, and if you like what we do across all the different shows we do here on the Knife Junkie podcast, whether it's the interview show or the Wednesday supplemental that you're listening to right now or Thursday Night Knives or any of the videos we put up or the town halls, and uh, you have a little extra scratch, you think it's worth your time and money, go check out Patreon. We have uh, three levels of support, three, five, and ten dollars. Uh, and those who enter on the $10 level, uh, are entered into a monthly knife giveaway. Monthly knife giveaway. Pretty good. Pretty good, I got to say. And uh, this week, or this month, the uh, knife in question was a Great, great Eastern Cutlery number 38. This version they call the 38 Special. It's a single blade with a muskrat clip point. And uh, this is mine. And the, the one that uh, was up for giveaway has the green tractor jig bone handles, which are astoundingly beautiful. Uh, I do not have the giveaway knife in hand yet. It is on its way from collectorknives.net, but you know how 
uh, things are going right now in terms of the mail. So should be here as soon as, I don't know, whenever it gets here, I will send it out to the winner. Who is Jesse Tellis? Uh, thank you very much, Jesse. He is a gentleman junkie. That's a $10 supporter. And uh, I do appreciate it. Jesse, you are a gentleman and a scholar, and we appreciate your support here. Your uh, green tractor bone GEC number 38 special will be on its way as soon as it's uh, in my hands. And actually, I expect it will ship after Christmas, just with how things are going. So, uh, so keep your eyes peeled, Jesse, but I'll let you know when it's headed on the way. So now, ordinarily... I would tell you all the new knives I've gotten in the last week or or maybe the uh, the new handles I've had made or the sharpening job I've had done or this or that. But honest to goodness, I got nothing for you this week. Nothing new. And um, I can't, I can't, uh, I would be lying if I said, I don't feel a bit of pride. I, I feel a little bit of pride. Look at me. Look at the discipline. Look at the discipline. Well, it is Christmas time. And I do need to save my shopping time, which is limited, and my shopping dollars, which are limited, uh, for others. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I'm also hoping that maybe that uh, that little month-long sabbatical from knife purchases with the, with the asterisk, and if you've been listening, you know what the asterisk is, um, maybe that did me some good. I, I hope it did. In any case, uh, check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and like, comment, subscribe, share, and definitely call the listener line, 724-466-4487, to let us know what you've been carrying, let us know what knives you love, uh, what you're surprised about, what uh, knives you're looking forward to are in 2021, and anything else. Anything else except criticism. Uh, I think the phone line won't accept it, as a matter of fact, so... So just good things. <laughs> just kidding. All right. So there it is. Uh, listener line, uh, 724-466-4487. Next, let's move on to life, knife life news. I screwed up. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Okay. So this episode, the, the main thrust of this episode are the 10 uh, most carried fixed blade knives of 2020. But uh, interesting, there are two fixed blade knives that are extremely compelling that are brand new on the market. Um, and I wanted to show them here today. And actually, I just thought it was coincidental, beautifully so, that these two new knives are coming out on this week when I'm talking about fixed blades. Uh, first is from one of my favorite uh, knife manufacturers out there, Tops Knives out of Idaho. Tops Knives, their first pickhaul knife. Okay, you know Tops Knives. Tops, they're known for their first and foremost for their high speed, low drag operator knives, and then for their camping knives. And then they started doing folding knives and all sorts of little neck knives and things. And they've really expanded their, their range, their product range since those first couple of uh, uh, super tactical military knives. And uh, now they have they have ventured into the Pical realm. And I've been talking about Pical knives here for about six months now. And, and they excite me because they're different and interesting and a little uh, counterintuitive. Uh, whether you know what to look at at a knife or not, they, they, look, they seem a little bit odd, like backwards. Um, you've got the edge on the, on the spine of the blade and you've got, uh, you've got the handle set up for you to hold the tip down. What is this thing? Well, it's, it's a knife that is uh, a knife style that's designed for close quarters combat, for gross motor movement and for attacking basically with a cat's claw. So thank God, or no, no, no. Let's, let's, let's move it down a couple of rungs. Thank tops for coming out with a Pical knife because uh, they are one of the kings of tactical knives and and the pakal knife just needs to be uh, addressed by all of those out there making making tactical knives or and, and when I say tactical we had this big discussion I'm talking about fighting self-defense or you know uh, those kind of backup knives uh, so the pakal is based on the lioness and uh, and another one of their outdoors knives. Uh, now it's it's uh, it's slipping my mind, but they've basically taken the the uh, lioness handle. A uh, lioness is a is a, a a long time model of theirs, and uh, and they put the handle to the what is that called? Uh, it's like the um, 
oh, I don't remember what it's called, some sort of uh, some sort of a uh, outdoors knife. And instead of sharpening the drop point edge, they sharpened the spine. So they basically reversed the blade and put it on a uh, put it on the handle to the the lioness. And I gotta say. It looks better than both of the component knives that it comes from. And I know I might be a little biased at the moment because I'm really interested in this style uh, of knife, but I think that this thing, um, uh, I, I, okay, you know me, I'm shallow. I think it looks great. I think it looks better than both of those knives, but it also kind of looks a little bit more useful to me. Um, also, there's one concern I have. So this is no doubt out of 1095 steel because uh, most of their knives, most of Topps knives are 1095 high carbon steel. And if they're not, it's usually 154 CM and they don't coat them. This, as you can see, is a coated blade. So I, uh, I suspect it's 1095, though the article didn't specify. I, I, I'm hoping that in the that they break ranks with tradition here and they make it a little bit thinner and a little bit lighter because a big part of the Pical thing, aside from tip down, edge in, is light and quick, light, quick, and small, not, you know, like I'm looking at this handle and it's, it's, it's on the, it's on the, it looks like it's long enough, maybe just even slightly too long. And, uh, and, and the only reason I say that is I'm thinking about how I would carry this in my belt. Um, this comes with a, what looks like a much thinner Kydex sheath than what is usually uh, supplied with a tops knife. And it also looks like the footprint of it is smaller. The overall footprint of a Kydex sheath is very important um, in terms of whether you're gonna carry it or not uh, um, concealed. Because you can't have a big giant you know, paddle sheath stuck in your belt and, and be expected to move and bend at the waist and do all that stuff. So the sheath uh, looks like it's accommodating of this type design. And I'm very interested to find out uh, how this thing is gonna feel in hand. Uh, so I better get it. I better I better run right out and 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 give Tops a call. Uh, I think that this uh, is going to be a successful knife, and I I have a feeling Tops is gonna is gonna burst forth with a couple more. Uh, and and because it's an it's a genre worthy of exploring, and I think a lot of people are still hot on it. The Tops Pical knife is called, by the way, the Unzipper, the Unzipper, which is mm, just a little bit. Uh, a little bit too illustrative for, for my for my taste. Um, <laughs> you know, unzipping your opponent, it's kind of nasty. So uh, I, I, I would prefer something else, but I'll go with the unzipper. Um, by Tops, coming soon. Uh, the next knife I'm excited about, it is kind of on a different, uh, different playing field. It is a fixed blade EDC knife. This is not a self-defense knife. This is not a camping knife. This is not anything but that daily carry knife, but it's fixed. And now a lot of people run into issues with that um, because of size and because of legality. Let's not even talk about legality. It can be difficult to EDC to everyday carry a fixed blade knife because uh, legally where I am legally, uh, I could walk outside with a Bowie knife strapped to my hip, but, but being a good neighbor and, and being a citizen, <laughs> you know, like I don't, I don't mean to cause anyone consternation and freak people out. I also don't need a visit by the cops and I'm not going to die on that hill. Well, the law says I can wear. Okay. Okay. So this is the knife that you might consider if you're interested in the EDC fixed blade type knife, but uh, you just need something small and discreet. This is from MKM. That's Maniago Knife Makers. Uh, it's a it's a consortium of Lion Steel, Vox, I mean, I'm sorry, Lion Steel Knives, Fox Knives, uh, Mercury Knives, and uh, another one. And <laughs> they all uh, got, they started this a few years back. They get together and they, they have designs and they share research. They take, have Sorry, they receive designers from uh, designs from big time designers. Oh my gosh. I'm going to start over again. MKM, Maniago Knife Makers of Italy. It's a bunch of big time knife makers, uh, knife making companies in Maniago, Italy, who source designs from big time designers and then produce them, sharing resources and coming out with beautiful things like this. This little thing, as you can see, is a two and a half finger um, knife that can just pop in your pocket. It's called the micro and it comes with a beautiful little leather 
sheath. Uh, it's funny, mostly uh, you see things like this, you definitely expect Kydex almost all the time, especially if it's intended as a neck knife, which you can assume that this is because most very small um, fixed blade knives are intended as neck knives first, and then usually play a secondary role as a drop in the pocket fixed blade. Um, but uh, this this being a uh, small enough knife, it's a it's just under two inch blade, and the handle is just over two inches. You got that giant finger choil and that jimping there. It's a pinch knife, really. It's a pinch knife, and uh, this is something you probably want a little fob on there so you could you could grip it uh, with a with a fuller grip. But this comes in M M three ninety steel, which is great for an EDC blade because how often do you want to sharpen this little thing? You probably don't. And if you're popping open boxes with it and letters and, and maybe cutting an apple or whatever day in, day out, and you have M390 steel, you are not going to have to sharpen this sucker for a long time. I think it's quite beautiful. They also have a Warncliffe version, um, which did I not mention? Well, I can see that uh, the, the uh, graphic says this, but Jesper Voxna has designed this. And you can tell. I mean, you look at the handle. That's has... Uh, Jesper Voxen has written all over it. But if you could see the other, the Warncliffe, which I've I've only seen one uh, quick quick shot of, it definitely looks like a Voxnez uh, blade design. Um, for a Warncliffe, to me, it's not pointy enough. You know, uh, I like I like a pointy sax like Warncliffe. But in any case, these knives are are great, great um, looking, and presumably great quality because of where they come from and what they're made out of. And uh, if you're interested in, in dipping your toes in that uh, fixed blade EDC world, this is a very tempting one to 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 look into. The only thing I would say is, if you're if you're new to neck knives or fixed blade knives, maybe you want to check out the Minimalist first, which is uh, about the same size and and uh, you know uh, a, a fraction of the cost, just to see if you're interested in the in the genre itself. Uh, but yeah, so two great small fixed blade knives, one from Tops, one from MKM, and um, I'm excited about both of them. I I think that the Tops knife might have to find its way to my collection, even if temporarily, just to check out. So there you have it. So uh, please call that listener line, 724-466-4487, and tell me what I should be excited about for 2021. One of the things I love about this show and this channel is that I've gotten a chance to meet so many people who know what's going on. I rarely know what's going on, but um, try to surround myself with people who do <laughs> so I can find out what the hell is going on. So let me know, 724-466-4487. Let me know what's going on and what knives are coming out in uh, 2021 that you think I might be uh, jazzed about. All right, coming up, my 10 most carried and used fixed blade knives in 2020. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. So I love this time of year, uh, well, for many reasons, but I love this time of year on YouTube and Instagram because all of the people I follow, all of the great knife reviewers that I love and the great uh, collectors who have all the things I want, um, they come forward and they say, these are the top 10 knives released in 2020. And they and they come out with all their different categories. And I love that. I love watching it. And um, the reason I can't quite do those videos is that, um, well, I'm not out there looking for all the latest and greatest and newest stuff all year long. There are uh, a lot of great channels out there, and that that's their MTA is to find the latest knives and and present them to people so that they know whether it's going to be something they're they're going to want to buy when they hit the market wide. I could rattle off, and you could rattle off many of those names, and uh, I love and respect them all. However, that is not me. So I'm going to tell you my top ten, and a lot of this just comes from my collection. Only a few of them are new this year. Uh, and only one of them was new for this year. So uh, if that makes, if that distinction makes any sense. Uh, so here, but before we get into it, before we get into the top 10, I'm going to show you my top three runners up. Uh, I do this with the other ones too. This is just so that I don't have to come up with 10. I can come up with 13, but uh, kick, kick three of them to the runners up list. First one is, uh, well, it's a little bit of self-promotion, but I don't, 
necessarily mean it to be so. This here is a DeMarco knife and tool liberator Bowie. Okay, so this is a knife you've seen many times if you've watched this uh, watch this podcast or this uh, channel. This is a knife I made a few years back. Um, the first knife I ever finished, maybe the second. And uh, you might look at it and say, it's not finished. <laughs> well, it's roughly finished, roughly hewn. Uh, named after the B-24 Liberator and also kind of cleverly named Liberator because you liberate yourself from a bad situation with it. It is a full-bellied Bowie uh, at, with a long uh, sharpened swedge. It's a style I like to call a Virginia Bowie. Uh, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I showed the big fixed blade I made recently, and it's a larger version of this to some extent. This one I built to carry, so that handle is perfect not to jab into my manly love handles and such. And uh, so this little Bowie knife um, has has been with me a lot. I mean, I, I, I throw this in my belt a lot. I wear it in the waistband, in the small of my back. Uh, but since it's not something anyone else can get, I figured this this would be this should be a runner up. <clears throat> Next runner up. Now this knife rides in the car with me all the time, and it gets used for random tasks. It also just gets absentmindedly fondled uh, fondled when I'm driving or at a red light or whatever. Uh, but it is this cold steel roach belly in a homemade um, sheath. Now I told you before I was talking about how. A big wide paddle sheath can be um, hard to EDC in the waistband. And this is a perfect example of that. I made this, this was the first um, Kydex sheath I ever made, and it's it's pretty good. But I gave it a lot of extra room on, on all sides. And um, eh, it doesn't doesn't carry that well. Uh, it'll do in a pinch, but this is the knife. The roach belly. I think this is an outstanding knife. And if you only have uh, 15 bucks to spend on a fixed blade, this could be one that you should go for. Uh, two things. First of all, the handle does not come like this. It comes, well, pretty close to smooth, but I uh, just sort of gave it a texture so it, so it would be more grippy. And uh, the steel is German Krupp 4116. And if you know Krupp Stahl is no joke, this is a, uh, well, it's not a joke steel by any means, but it's it's softer, but it's a high performance steel for being so soft. I mean, it it's a great workhorse. And that funny, funny thing about this knife, the roach belly, first of all, it's designed um, or inspired by uh, an early American trapper style knife, or, or, or I should say a knife that early American trappers used. And... Uh, that being so, it is a work knife, um, but it could be definitely pushed into a, a self-defense knife. But what I, the reason I brought it up is that I met a guy in New York years back who had spent four or five years bumming around the country. And I say bumming around, that makes it sound like he was a ne'er-do-well. He was actually, you know, finding himself and camping and, and doing odd jobs and traveling and kind of doing things that uh, having a, a little span of life that I was frankly, envious of, not envious, jealous of, um, you know, who doesn't want to just take off and not see anyone for a year and just sort of live? Well, maybe, maybe not me either, but this guy traveled all over the world, all over the country for about four years. And this was his only knife, not this one in particular, but, uh, he came to visit a friend of mine and then he came to visit me. I asked him, Oh yeah, you're, you're traveling all over. What, what's your knife situation like? And this is what he pulled out. And I have to say, at the time, I was incredibly disappointed. I was like, you should have something way more big and nasty and gnarly. And uh, really, that that little knife held him in good stead that that entire that entire period. So uh, for me, that's a that's a pretty good endorsement. Love that knife. Uh, lastly, in the runners up, the Victorinox fruit knife. Fruit knife, you say? What are you talking about? Well, after I had my conversation with Ed Calderon, uh, and he was talking about the Pical st style of uh, knife and how they are used, I went and, well, he was also talking about how you can turn a simple Victorinox fruit knife into a Pical style fighting knife. 
or self-defense last ditch, you know, self-defense knife. Uh, these are great and very useful, sharp little utility knives. I mean, they're great in the kitchen. I have one in, in our kitchen too. Um, but this one I bought with the intention of turning into a, a, a drop in pocket self-defense knife. So I bought the thing and then per, per Ed Calderon's uh, suggestion, hit it with a heat gun and bent it so that it would form conform to the human hand a little better, especially in reverse tip down grip. Carved a little notch in there. And then I made this little sheath that uh, I have seen many people use before. And then this little hook as you drop this in your pocket and as you extract the whole package, this hook on the sheath grabs on the inside of your pocket. The sheath drops into your pocket. Your hand emerges with the knife in it. Um, it's kind of like the fixed blade version of a wave in a weird way. So those were my three runners up. So I, I made that Victoria Knox uh, fruit knife. Well, I got the Victoria Knox fruit knife, altered it, and then carried it in my front right pocket next to my main carry for, for several months before I got a replacement, which you will see coming up. So these are the runners up. I'm going to move them. Actually, I'm going to sheathe them because I'm going to sheathe them because you don't need to see any blood on this here show. All right. So getting into the top 10 most carried or used and used fixed blade knives. I'm going to go for this is these are kind of in no particular order, but this one got used a lot this year. I'm going to put it down here on the knife cam. And that is the Cold Steel Trailmaster Bowie. Now this Trailmaster, I got 20 to 20, let's just say 20 years ago. And uh, it never, I, uh, you know, at the time I lived in New York and it was just to have a cool Bowie knife and uh, never, never, ever really used it. And then when I moved out here to the provinces, uh, and had a yard and, and stuff to take care of. I started bringing it out to see what it was made of. And um, this has really turned into my kindling knife. We, uh, like many suburbanites, have a fire pit in the back to try and connect us to our primal origins. And when we have a fire and we need to make kindling, I baton this quarter inch thick wedge <laughs> through, uh, through the wood to make the kindling. Um, could I use an ax? Yeah. Actually, I think that I'm better with a knife than an axe. So I think in my case, uh, making Tinder with a knife is a is a better bet. It's also a hell of a lot of fun. You've seen a million people online doing it when they're camping and you're not. You're sitting in some office and you flip on YouTube and you see some guy out there living his best life, batoning wood, making a fire, you know, cooking up a steak, smoking a cigar, drinking some whiskey. And you're like, uh, well, I, I have the knife, you know, and there's some wood in the backyard. And so, yeah, that's that's what this has done. This thing is incredibly strong. I have no idea what the steel is that they were using 20 years ago, uh, but I cannot get <laughs> these are uh, like that's sap, I think, from from a white pine. I hate white pine trees. And this is just another reason um, I can't get that sap off. But uh, eventually, I'm sure I will. All right. Next. Let's see. Oh, this one. This one got major carry time and major play. This is the Topps Rapid Strike. A great knife designed by Leo Espinoza and new last year, new in 2020. This thing is such a great little EDC. Well, it's not so little for an EDC, but it's a great knife to everyday carry. Uh, I opted to have it in the double edge configuration. Uh, but more commonly, I'm sure you'll find it in the single-edged configuration. And uh, it is meant to be a, again, a last-ditch self-defense knife. But it is an incredibly capable cutter. It is an incredibly capable knife. And if you buy this thing without the uh, top edge sharp sharpened, you know, you could really use this as a great uh, medium to small size utility knife. Uh, it does come with a a pyramidal, pyramidally ground, uh, um, what's that, pommel uh, for a glass breaker. But I ground that off because I don't like the way it feels. Like this to me is very much a reverse grip knife. And uh, that 
that pyramid of steel on the top hurts the thumb when I when I cap it in reverse grip like this. So I ground that off. And actually, now I'm considering grinding off even just a little bit more and, and rounding it off and making the handle a little bit sho uh, shorter and rounder. I, found, I find that as I get shorter and rounder, I like the knife handles on my EDC blades to be shorter and rounded off because of where I like to carry them. Sometimes uh, uh, at six or at uh, three o'clock on my hip in the waistband or in the uh, in the back, and just too much material there when you sit down starts to poke the ribs or poke the extra that shouldn't be there anyway, and is a reminder of what a lazy sod you are. So I just sanded it, I just ground it off with a grinder there. Great, great knife. Highly, highly recommend that knife. If you're going to get uh, like one tops knife, I, I very well may say get this one. Okay. Oh, oh my. So next we have, and this is, this is, this has currently taken the place of the fruit knife. And that is the Ed Calderon designed Copus design, uh, design works made Elvia. So you can see it's got that same sort of sheath, a beautiful sheath, much nicer than the one I made, but the concept is there. It's got the hook so that you drop this in your pocket and orient it properly so that when you reach in, your finger fits right into this little notch. There's a notch at the back top of the handle, front top of the handle, and you pull it out of your pocket, the hook grips on the, uh, on the edge of your pocket, and boom, you come out with this. And it is an unusual looking knife. I will grant you that. It is unusual. The, the angle of the blade to handle is what threw me off when I first saw it. But uh, really, when you have this in your hand, it acts like a cat's claw. You've got the uh, you've got the point reaching forward. Look at how it's look at how the how the uh, if you look at this knife gripped in reverse grip in the hand, you see that the blade reaches forward with that angle, so that as you are um, using these gross motor movements to defend yourself uh, with that in your hand you're going to make contact with that point. And then having the edge on the reverse side, as you draw your arm back to recock, to re to, to restrike, it tears, it rips. It rips like a cat's claw. As opposed to a karambit, which cuts up this way, it's cutting this way, like a claw. So anyway, oh, wasn't that, that was a pretty cool de demonstration, I think. Um, so this became a, really a daily carry for me. Once I got this to replace the fruit knife, um, I love this thing. It, it's super light. And if you look at it, it's got, it's got GRN handles and, but they are super tough and light and dense. And it's got sort of a, a nice, uh, profile in that direction too. So, uh, the Elvia from Copus Design Blade Works and Ed Calderon. Now this next one is truly an EDC. Meaning, oh, meaning every day carry. And that is the Bastinelli Diagnostic. Now, the Diagnostic is a knife that uh, I've had my eye on for years um, because I've been carrying a small neck knife behind my work ID for years. And for a long time, it was the Minimalist. A couple of different uh, variations of the Minimalist rode behind this for a long time. And then... I, uh, I traded up and got this Bastinelli Diagnostic. The Diagnostic is a two-finger karambit. Two, yeah, two-finger karambit. And uh, unlike traditional karambits, is way more set up for, for a forward hand grip like this. And uh, because in reverse grip, it's too small. It's too small. It'd be weird to manipulate. You can't really control it very well like that. Uh, but so this knife is outstanding for uh, opening packages. It's outstanding for all the little tasks, except for food prep and stuff like that, that you might come across in your daily uh, office life. This is Actually, I've used this to cut paper. I'm particular about how paper is cleaved, and I use this to cut paper. Uh, I've used this to open up uh, envelopes and boxes 
but mostly it just hangs out behind my uh, work ID for uh, moments when I need it. And, uh, you know, they are far and few between, but uh, I'm glad it's there. I'm going to orient it that way. All right, so that is the Bastinelli Diagnostic. That is out of D2 steel, by the way, as are many Bastinelli knives. Next, this knife is one that is by my bed all the time now. Uh, yes, I've talked about the Cold Steel Master Tanto that's in the drawer. And uh, yes, I've talked about having the... <laughs> um, having the, the Roman Gladius next to the bed, but this is the reasonably sized knife next to the bed. And it is, it is the Bark River Knives mini bush sacks in green canvas micarta, with beautiful red liners, Coke bottle handle, great, uh, what is this? Um, A1 tool steel blade, which I, which does not patina like other <laughs> uh, other steels. I kind of jet this up trying to patina it, and then I've been trying to polish it totally clean ever since. Um, this is a great little knife. Very, very uh, fine tip. And in a sheath that I created uh, out of Kydex, the reason I have this next to my bed is that I can pop off the sheath really easily in case I needed it. Um, I, I did this like, <laughs> like I'm I'm stabbing some demon that's on me on my sleep. But really, what I mean is like, if I'm doing something, hanging pictures, I'm always doing something in the bedroom that requires a knife, and it's always there. So, so that uh, Bark River mini bush sacks is uh, is a great sample. Now I have another Bark River knife coming up. Who doesn't love Bark River knives for for fixed blades? They're just they're just stunning. So next, now this one got very little carry or use, but let's just say it was always on my mind all year long. So this is the uh, Attention to Detail Mercantile Fighter. This is a custom knife, uh, probably my very first custom knife. Uh, this is a sheath my brother made. And uh, look at this, look at this beauty. So this was made by Douglas Esposito of Attention to Detail Mercantile. He's out of Virginia. And uh, he's a former Marine, or I know some people say once a Marine, always a Marine. So he's a Marine who is no longer active. <laughs> and he's got a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school and is a, is a coach. And he's a, he's, a, he's a man of many, many uh, talents. And knife making, I think, is uh, his greatest talent that I'm aware of. Look at this beauty. So this was another knife I opted to have um, double edge ground. This is a bayonet style grind in that um, the top grind and the bottom grind are, are not equal, but they are both hollow and they're both very, very sharp. He crowned the spine here and the, the tactile sensation of that crowned spine with this thick jimping is it just feels good in hand. This thing is just beautiful. And then uh, I asked him to do it with uh, tortoise shell. And I just think it, it looks like a gentleman's assassin knife. Okay. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> and I love it. I love this thing. Thank you, Douglas. I have another Esposito knife, but it's a folder. So you won't be seeing it here. All right. I'm going to move these knives out of the way so that the next gathering of eagles can take place here on our cutting board. So, A2D fighter. Next, you're going to see, I think you might be noticing a preponderance of clip point style blades, Bowie type blades. This one was a gift from my good friend, Kurt, uh, Kurt Zapeta, who was actually one of my first interviewees on this show. He, is a, he, was, a, uh, he was a paramedic at the time, and uh, we talked a lot about knife trauma. Hmm, knife trauma. So this is uh, the Condor Bay, uh, the Condor Hudson Bay knife, and this is based on a knife that trappers uh, in Canada and in Northern America used in the 17 and 1800s, uh, according to the Condor website. But I have seen uh, many examples of this style knife since then, and if you look at it, it looks like a Bowie knife mi mixed with a butcher or a kitchen knife, and it's it's a general do everything knife. This is for camp. This is for trapping, dressing out animals, for utility, for, you know, fighting, for 
defense, whatever you need it for. And uh, the way Condor, who produces their, their knives in uh, El Salvador, the way they make this one, they put all of those faux hammer uh, dim dimples in the blade there to make it look like uh, sort of roughly hewn, homemade sort of uh, old school knife. And that's all just there for looks. It doesn't uh, have any effect on the on the performance of this thing. And this thing does perform. Um, this is kind of a bang, bang around knife. This was my, this is what I was using before I started using the, um, the Cold Steel Trailmaster Bowie. I put a new edge on this one just recently because 1095, this is 1095. And with the jobs I use this for, it tends to chip. And the last time uh, it chipped, it was from over swinging and, and hitting the crossbar of a chain link fence and uh, put a big ding in that. So 1095 steel though, uh, will not, it will break less readily as it's a tough carbon steel. So, um, so all you got to do is sharpen out the, sharpen out the dings. And that's what I did with this one. Uh, to me, this, this is a real, uh, old school. This is like a proto Bowie knife. And, uh, that's one of the things I really like about that. Aside from the fact that it was a uh, gift knife from a very close friend. Next, here's the big daddy. Big daddy of them all. This is the Bark River Shining Mountain Bowie. Now this I did not use or carry all year. But it had some use. I, I, I will tell you the use it had. So when I sit down um, on a Saturday evening with my daughters and my wife after dinner to watch a movie and we're all hanging out and we're all comfy and cozy on the couch. I always have this close at hand, uh, either, you know, hidden in the couch cushions or somewhere just in case that fictional moment or not fictional. Ho well, hopefully fictional, but just in case that horrible moment happens where a stranger walks into the room unexpectedly. And, uh, yes, I know what you say. You defend your home with a gun. Yes, you do. But when I'm sitting around with my girls, I know there's a gun close by. I could run to if I needed to. But uh, I feel like now, now this is just me welcoming you, welcoming you into this strange world inside my head. OK, so so just uh, come with me for a second. But I feel like one look at this thing uh, might send someone who's not serious running. And then if it doesn't send that person who's serious running and they don't happen to have a firearm drawn on me, well, then it's go time, daddy-o. And uh, this displaces a lot in a room. And uh, I, I'm i smitten with it. What can I say? I love the shape of the Bowie. The, the blade itself is very reminiscent of the style knife that uh, Brad Pitt used in Inglorious Bastards. It's that same old, Scott, uh, old school upswept Bowie. I love that there's room for your finger there. You've got this asymmetrical guard. And uh, you know Bark River Knives, you can opt for a million different handle options. Uh, but I saw this and I had to have it. This is their, not only their stacked leather, but it's, it's made to look antiqued. So it's antiqued stacked leather. You've got this contoured Coke bottle handle, beautiful liners. So this thing saw a lot of being pulled out and stashed close at hand this year. Uh, it's not one to carry, not one to use very much. Uh, I have no doubt it would do excellently outside or around the camp or whatever. But I mean, come on, if I go camping and pull this out, everyone's going to know I'm not a camper. They're gonna be like, who's the dilettante? So so just for just for protecting house and home, hearth and home. So that's the Bark River Knives Shining Mountain Bowie. Uh, second to last, but certainly not least. Well, that doesn't make sense, but uh, is another tops knife. Now, this is one that does get carried quite a bit. It's called the Felony Stop, and it's designed by Lacey Zabo. Lacey Zabo is a, uh, uh, you know, um, martial artist, former special force law enforcement kind of guy who uh, designs knives, designs really cool and unique knives. Um, and uh, for, for primarily for self-defense. And this is, uh, this one has been in the tops lineup for a long time. And I'll show you why, because it is rad. Look at this. 
So the felony stop is a dagger, but it's in a pistol grip format. So it's a, it's a short, what's this, three and a half inch dagger. Let's see, one, two. Yeah, it's about three, three and a quarter inch blade there, sharp on both sides. But you have, you have the uh, blade presented at an angle from the handle in a pistol grip style. That allows for less torquing of the wrist, more, like a more natural posture of the wrist in a thrust. And also in reverse grip, it makes it possible to slash. I know you see a lot of movies with people slashing in reverse grip. Yes, it's possible to slash. It's very impractical with a straight bladed knife to do that. But with something like this, or a karambit or anything where the angle is different and you have the blade reaching beyond your hand uh, is, is gonna work much better for a backhanded slash. Now a backhanded slash is something you do on the way to a backhanded thrust. It's not a main, you know, it's not a, it's not a primary technique, I guess you might say. And then you might say, how do you know, Bob? You're not, you're not in, a, you've never been in a knife fight. You're not a knife fighter. Just from the the training I've I've had, if 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 it's any good, and I think it is, uh, that is the case. Here you have this beautiful giant jimped thumb swale for for really profound <laughs> thumb purchase in a thrust or a slash or for whatever purpose. So that you, and and this is absolutely necessary with a short uh, double edged bladed knife because your thumb has to go somewhere and. Uh, and to just have a flat run of jimping here is going to be dangerous because any sort of impact from the front will send your thumb onto that. But to have this swale scooped out here and with jimping, it's way more secure. So this knife, uh, this is a beautiful, outstanding design. And one more thing, Jim, um, when you have it in reverse grip like this, this swale acts as a way to trap. It's kind of hard to show right here. Uh, but if you're trying to hold on to someone's wrist in a in a technique, you're trying to pull someone like that, that little scoop there with the jimping helps grab. So the felony stop, great subtle name. I love it. Felony stop. Jeez, what's that for? And uh, yeah, really, really great knife. Gets carried a lot. And like I was talking about the short rounded handles, this is perfect for the old for the old love handles because it's gentle, it's small, it's not pointy, it curves just like your body. So uh, big fan of this knife, big fan of this knife. Lastly, and maybe leastly because it's kind of the least exciting of the bunch, but one of the most, this is the knife that dropped before. Let me, let me just fish it off the ground. Sorry about that. This is one of the least exciting knives, but in another way, one of the most mm, interesting. This is the Mora number two. <gasps> Mora, you say? But you're not an outdoorsman. This knife gets a ton of use. Now, I, I bought this because I love the old looking Mora. This to me looks like something my grandfather had, actually. He probably had a Mora, but this sort of old wooden handle and and uh, the construction with the little guard and the and the and the um, scanty bl uh, ground blade, this thing is a workhorse. It hangs on my on my tool wall in my uh, you know my tool area, my little shop here. And when you know, things need to be cut, this is what I usually reach for. Uh, I mean, I cut sandpaper with this. I cut wood with this, or I've used it to shape. Um, I've used it to shape uh, Kydex. This thing is just great. And the Scandi ground blades are so effective, especially if you're using, it's gonna sound funny, especially if you're using it for cutting things <laughs> like cutting micarta or trimming, uh, trimming materials. You can really angle, get, the, get that, that Scandi ground angle right on what you're doing and almost use it as a chisel. Scandi ground, Scandinavian grind is a zero ground edge, meaning the main bevel of the blade is the edge. There is no secondary edge. And uh, it's a thin way to grind a knife and it's a very effective uh, cutting edge for, especially for wood. That's why most um, woodcraft knives are scanty ground. 
So this is number 10 on the, um, on the list of most carried and used fixed blade knives of 2020. Incidentally, um, I've heard it said that these also make excellent last ditch tactical knives, which I think is hilarious because Moras are all bright and cheery and colorful and, and they're, they're, they're good time camp knives. You know, you're going outside and they're, they're happy and they feel good and squeezy in the hand. But uh, I have heard from people who know that they are outstanding in a fight. So there you go. Something to note, something to note. Wow, it's been a voyage, not just a journey, it's been a voyage. And uh, I wanna thank you for hanging in there and checking out my 10 most carried used and fixed blades of uh, 2020. It's been fun to think about these things and th kind of go over in my mind what, what, the, what the favorite and the most used were over the past year and to kind of bring them out, show them off, and then maybe figure out what the fate of them are. I guess these will all stick around because they've proven themselves useful, but what about the ones who didn't make the list? Do I get rid of them? Probably not. Anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe or you'll be on the naughty list. I've been seeing these uh, t-shirts that uh, seems like only good looking girls wear and it says, Santa, define naughty. I love that. Anyway, so like, subscribe and uh, share this video with people uh, that you might think might like it. And that's uh, that's the probably the greatest way to help help me and help this channel. If not, definitely check out Patreon. That's another great way to help the channel. If you don't feel like sharing the video, you can go to Patreon and well, patronize us. <laughs> All right. So that's me for the day. And that's me for the year. And I want to thank everyone who's here and listening. Um, all the time. It's greatly appreciated. There is no Thursday Night Knives uh, this week at Christmas Eve. I will be spending with my family. And then next week will be New Year's Eve. And I will also, we will also not be uh, doing uh, uh, Thursday Night Knives on that night either. Like I like to say, I, I hope to be useless at that time. So there you go. So thanks for uh, hanging in there for 2020. 2021 is coming up and I, I hear it's going to be way better. I hear 2020 was just a fluke and that 2021, it's like minutes after uh, the, the turn of the hour and the turn of the year, things will start getting better. You believe that, I believe that, and uh, maybe it'll happen. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying thanks to everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful holiday season. Have a happy new year. And definitely don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.